Hello everyone, this is part one of Eye Emergencies in the Wilderness lecture series. Here is a quick roadmap for this part of the lecture. First, we will talk about general approach to eye complaints in the wilderness, including the physical exam. We'll briefly talk about eye anatomy, what you should carry in the medical kit specific for the eye, and uh, then we will discuss uh, some common or more dangerous traumatic eye conditions that can occur in the wilderness. So the general approach. First of all, figure out whether your eye condition is traumatic versus atraumatic. If it is atraumatic, further characterize this into red versus white eye, and we will talk about this in part two of the lecture series. Then perform your physical exam. Another important task to do is uh, figure out whether the pain resolves with administration of topical anesthetic. Because if it does, this points to more superficial condition of the eye. Then you will stabilize and treat uh, the patient depending on what you think is going on with them. And uh, then figure out whether they need emergent or urgent evacuation from the field. So the physical exam in the wilderness. Make sure you check your visual acuity. If you have um, one of those apps, uh, definitely use that. If not, get patient to read something and uh, let them determine how good their visual acuity is. Uh, check the extraocular muscle movement, pupillary reflexes, and don't forget the periorbital evaluation. Check for crepitus, a swelling, a point tenderness. This can point uh, to um, orbital floor fracture. Perform your fluorescent staining if available, and for that you will need fluorescent strips and cobalt blue light shown uh, here below in the picture. You can get it for very cheaply on Amazon. It's a tiny little light, so it doesn't take up a lot of room. And then perform your anesthetic drop test, so I call it tetracaine test. And basically, if the pain is relieved uh, with administration of those drops, most likely this is a superficial condition, and that's good news. If you're an ultrasound fellow like me, then um, definitely use your ultrasound as part as an extension of your eye exam. It can help you diagnose many various conditions. Remember, ABCs always come first, so if this is uh, a patient with multi-trauma, you want to focus on IBCs and then do your physical exam of the eye. And uh, also perform a good neurological exam if someone develops sudden visual loss, as uh, this uh, could point towards stroke. And remember, your exam is still limited in the field, as you do not have a tone of pen to check intraocular pressures, you don't have an ophthalmoscope to look at the back of the eye, and you don't have the slit lamp. So anatomy of the eye. Uh, let's just cover some basics. From outside in, you've got your cornea and conjunctiva. Then you get to your interior chamber, which is between the cornea and the iris. You've got your lens next, and then the bulk of the eye is made of vitreous body. The back of the eye has the retina and optic nerve. So please familiarize yourself uh, with this chart so things make sense later on in the lecture. So what you should carry in your medical kit specific for the eye. The left side of um, this slide has some basic things and the right side has a little bit more advanced uh, meds that you might be carrying. So definitely pen, la pen light or flashlight are important. It helps you check for pupillary reflex. It also helps you examine the eye for foreign bodies, etc. Cobalt blue light, as I told you, um, I think is a good investment, um, so definitely have it, especially if you're planning to have fluorescent strips with you. Some sterile swabs are important, uh, as uh, they can you can use those to remove superficial foreign bodies on the eye. And uh, teardrops and saline are always a good idea. The anesthetic drops, and that's usually tetracaine, as it does not require refrigeration. Definitely had that in your kit. And uh, then the antibiotic drops, uh, and uh, you can go with erythromycin ointment, uh, or you can go with quinolones, but definitely a good idea. If you don't have antibiotic drops, you can always try to use a PO antibiotic um, as a temporary measure. Cycloplegics, um, and those a lot of times help with the pain, um, as uh, 
they stop the ciliary muscle spasm. They generally block the muscarinic receptor blockers. That's your atropine or cyclopentylate. Um, and then you've got some more specific meds uh, like timolol and acetazolamide. Those are used for acute angle closure glaucoma. However, acetazolamide is something you might have for altitude illness already. And then you've got your NSAIDs and steroids, and those are anti-inflammatory. And um, they come in a drop preparation or an oral preparations. And if you're an ultrasound fellow like me, once again, if you got your hands on one of those portable ultrasounds, definitely bring it along as it can make a difference. In the next few slides, we will discuss common uh, traumatic eye conditions that can be encountered in the wilderness. Globe rupture is a dangerous condition that you should not miss in the wilderness. Sometimes it can be very obvious and sometimes it's occult, so careful exam is important. You are looking for a sunken eye, irregular pupil, or teardrop pupil as shown in the picture to the left, leakage of aqueous or vitreous humor. Look for Sedel sign. Sedel sign is shown in the bottom picture and it's the streaming and pulling of fluorescein by aqueous humor from inside the eye. Complications of this condition include visual loss and endophthalmitis, which is infection of the globe. Uh, treatment uh, is really limited in the field. You should protect the eye from any further damage, so um, device some kind of protective shield. Administer antibiotics if you have those. Pain control is important. Antiemetics as needed. Vomiting will increase intraocular pressure, so you should avoid it and these people will need emergent evacuation. And um, people who have penetrating injury to the eye should really be treated the same as uh, globe rupture. So do not remove penetrating objects, stabilize it, and protect the eye. Lens dislocation is something that could happen in conjunction with a globe rupture, but it also can happen on its own. And basically, it's also known as ectopia lentis, and it's often due to trauma, though it also could be congenital and associated with Marfan syndrome. Uh, but basically, the symptoms are decreased vision, diplopia, edge glare, gauss images. Um, so on exam, uh, patients might have compromised visual acuity, some redness to the eye, and irregular pupil. And this condition is very easily diagnosed with an ultrasound. As you see below, the lens is basically swimming around in vitreous um, humor. So the complications of this condition is glaucoma. And uh, really, the treatment is surgical repositioning most of the time. So you need to evacuate these people. Retrobulbar hemorrhage is another important condition that's vision threatening that needs to be recognized right away in the field and basically this is a hemorrhage behind the globe and uh, it causes compressive optic neuropathy as the hematoma starts compressing the optic nerve. So on physical exam you will notice proptosis in that eye, um, elevated intraocular pressures are common, decreased visual acuity and afferent pupillary reflex and afferent pupillary defect is when you shine the light into affected pupil, it causes paradoxi paradoxical uh, pupillary dilation in both eyes. A lot of times, retrobulbar hemorrhage is associated with orbital bone fractures, so you should be checking for those. And as I mentioned, complication is really visual loss. Um, so there are a few things uh, that you can do. Um, really, these people need emergent evacuation for definitive care, but if you are qualified, uh, you can perform lateral canthotomy, which is the procedure shown at the bottom right, and uh, basically you incise um, the lateral canthus to release uh, the eye out of the eye socket, decreasing the retrobulbar pressure. This could be vision saving. Hyphema. This is a hemorrhage in the anterior chamber, and uh, this is due to the bleeding from blood vessels at the root of the iris. 
So this signifies significant eye contusion, and uh, you should look for uh, other possible traumatic injuries to the eye, like globe rupture and lens dislocation. The complications of hyphema include uh, rebleeding, acute angle closure, glaucoma, and visual loss. So in terms of management in the field, you should keep the patient upright and uh, avoid NSAIDs as uh, those can contribute to rebleeding. Consider cycloplegics uh, for um, symptom control and steroids, and these people will need emergent evacuation. And the reason why they need it is um, they do tend to develop um, acute angle closure glaucoma, and that, that cannot be easily diagnosed in the field. They'll need a serial tonopan measurements of the intraocular pressures. All right, corneal abrasion. That's probably one of the more common conditions, uh, traumatic eye conditions you'll find um, in uh, the wilderness. Uh, and really, it's an abrasion damage to the epithelial layer only, so very superficial a part of the cornea. Um, patients will present uh, with pain, photosensitivity, redness, and uh, you will find some fluorescein uptake as shown in the picture. So the fluorescein uptake looks green. Um, in the picture below, and uh, usually symptoms resolve or improve with anesthetic drops, so that's one of your clues for the diagnosis. And the treatment is antibiotic drops, cycloplegics as needed, pain meds, tetanus booster if they need one, although hopefully if this patient is on the wilderness trip, their tetanus is up to date. And these people usually recover in one to two days, so you do not necessarily need to evacuate them unless their condition is worsening. All right, and then we've got periorbital trauma. Um, so there are a couple of things. There could be lid lacerations, and let's talk briefly about entrapment. Uh, so simple lid lacerations, uh, you just perform standard care. Um, you will wash them out and probably suture if you've got a suture kit. Complex lid lacerations, however, need to be urgently evacuated. So we say usually within 36 hours for definitive care. And complex lid lacerations is one shown below. They're either full thickness um, laceration of the lid or they can involve the lid margin which is difficult to repair that needs a lot of precision or lacrimal duct uh, injury. And uh, obviously for the complex lid lacerations while you're waiting for evacuation you should irrigate the wound and apply antibiotic ointment if that's feasible. In terms of entrapment, uh, sometimes you can develop uh, entrapment of the extraocular muscles uh, when you have an orbital floor fracture. And one of the more commonly entrapped uh, muscles is the inferior rectus. So when you ask your patient to gaze up on your extraocular movement uh, muscle exam, you'll notice that the patient is not able to lift uh, to look up on the affected eye. So um, these patients will need to be evacuated as well. And that's the photo on the left. So stay tuned to part two of our eye lecture.